Thank you, Lord. Well, you, uh, you can remain standing for just a moment while I, I read a text. You can listen or you can just pick up your Bible. Just keep standing for a minute. But in Romans 8, have you ever read Romans 8? Woo! You talk about some life-changing truth. Romans 8, verse 1. I want you to read it with me out loud together. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> when, you, uh, when you read that or you hear that, your spirit jumps up and, and your head goes, what? We know it's good, but what are we? Your, your, your spirit knows this is bigger than my head realizes. Look at it again. Read it again. There is, therefore, when? Now? How much? No. Everybody say now. And then how much condemnation? No. How much is no? How much is no condemnation? A little bit? Not much. Huh? How much is no? No. no? no. That is absolutely no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. 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 Hallelujah. Free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because I have no condemnation now. And so I'm free. Hallelujah. Because I have no condemnation now. I'm free. I'm free from death. I'm free from the law of sin and death. Oh, glory to God. Say it out loud, Father God, open my eyes. Help me to see this better than I've ever seen it, stronger than I've ever seen it, and enable me to walk in the fullness of this liberty that I have now in Christ Jesus. Woo, glory to God. <laughs> oh, I'm free. 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 I'm free, I'm free. Cause the sun has set me free. I'm free. I'm free indeed. And whom the sun has set free is really free completely free 
unquestionably free. Really, 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 really free. Can you, can you get blessed under a tent? Yeah. Texas in July, yes you can. Yeah. Yes you are. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, can you be seated? Thanks guys. <laughs> Thanks be to God. We prayed a prayer. You're believing with me, right? Look at that verse again, Romans 8, 1. There is what? Now see, he's, this wasn't written in chapter and verse, so this is picking up from the ideas that were in chapter seven, six, five, four. There, there is therefore now. Now the word now, it means at present, but it also refers to now meaning as the result of. In other words, now, which also means right now. <laughs> You're what? Re read the verse. There is what? Therefore, because of, you know, you, you have to go back to chapters four, five, six, and seven. Because Jesus became sin with our sin, because he fixed what Adam did, because. Because of that, therefore, now, there is, oh, I'd preach this to myself. I, there is therefore now no condemnation. How many people in the church do you suppose are actually living with zero condemnation day in and day out? Well, so your answer tells me volumes. What, what are we saying? Most people are dragging a bunch of baggage. Hmm? Most, far too high a percentage, are living with some residue of guilt, shame, embarrassment, all different words for condemnation. Condemnation means, if, if you're condemned, it means you're guilty. If you're condemned and you're guilty, then it's reasonable to feel ashamed. If you're guilty, you're to be blamed and rightfully ashamed for whatever terrible bad thing you did. But there is now, it was, it used to be, it was, but there is therefore, now, as a result of what he's done now, and right, right now in the present moment, now there is no, no, condemnation. no, no condemnation. condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus, my brother, my sister? Are you? How many, come on, I wanna see a hand. I wanna hear something that you are in Christ Jesus. I have believed on him. 
I have received him as my Lord and Master. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. I am in him. Oh, somebody say, I am in him. And you know what Colossians said? You are complete in him. Ah, oh, the Spirit of God is helping us. He's helping us this morning with Brother Kenneth, and he's helping us now. I reckon he'll help us all week. Didn't the Scripture say, you are complete? A lot of times you'll hear single people say, well, I, I, I wish I could hurry up and find my soulmate so I can be complete. Well, you, you're not in Christ? Because if you're in Christ, you're not working on, you're not going to be, you are complete in him. Now, you can't be complete if you're broken. I take issue with Christians and people, churches advertise it and say, we're all just broken people but we're saved, then you're saying I'm not complete. I'm missing pieces, I'm, I'm injured, I'm scarred, I'm broken. Let's see, I'm getting looks across the crowd right now. <laughs> you were, you were, but therefore you are now there is now no condemnation, no guilt, no blame, no shame. People say, well, you, you, don't, you don't know what I've been through. I don't have to know. I've been through some stuff myself. You don't know what I've been through. I do know this. There is no sin too bad too big for God to forgive and heal. There is no hurt too deep, too bad for God to heal. Can he heal a body? Can he heal a mind? Can he heal your soul? Can he heal? There is nothing God can't heal if, if you'll let him. If you'll let him. But people hold on to their hurts because it's part of their chosen identity. And people use it to solicit sympathy and excuse heathen behavior. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> what do you mean? Christians, ministers act like heathen sometimes. And then you ask them about it. Well, I've been through so much. I had such a tough home life. <laughs> but that, that's back then. That's before now. Now we're in Christ Jesus. We were a bunch of messed up bad stuff, but now we are in Christ Jesus and you are complete. Oh, come on somebody say, I am complete in him. I know I'm not perfect in knowledge. I know I haven't finished growing and developing, but as far as being whole in my spirit, as far as being completely clean and completely made righteous and completely made holy, the Lord does not need to do one other thing to make that happen. When he said it is finished, it is finished. When he raised from the dead, it's done. It's, it's done. Coach, somebody say, I am, I am, I am complete in him now. And right now, I have no condemnation.
<laughs> Woo! Go to First John, please. The uh, the third chapter. First John three and twenty one or twenty. Condemnation is a much bigger problem and much worse thing than most people realize. It's one of the primary reasons Jesus came and paid the price. If he, if he couldn't deliver us from the guilt and the sin and the shame, then that would indicate he hadn't delivered us from the sin that caused it. If you're delivered from the sin, you are delivered from the guilt from the sin. Right? To say I'm delivered from the sin, but I'm not delivered from the guilt from the sin is irrational, unreasonable. It can't be. It's like saying, you know, I get the wet without the water. Or the water without the wet. Huh? If you're delivered from the sin, you are, whether you realize it or not, whether you act like it or not, you are delivered from the condemnation. True or not? If you're delivered from the sin, if the Lord paid the price for the sin, why would I live my life feeling guilty for the sin he paid for? I mean, that, that undoes a big part of the reason why he paid for it. If I'm not delivered from the condemnation, even though I'm delivered from the sin, then I'm not delivered from the effects of the sin. But we are. We are now. <laughs> Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And you just got through telling me you are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3, did you find it? 1 John 3. He said in verse 19, he said, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. You don't ever want to say, the Lord condemned me about something. That's contrary to scripture. You hear people say it. You hear people say, well, you know, I was in that meeting and boy, the spirit of God really condemned me about some things. He did not. You just said something that's untrue. In fact, in that same eighth chapter of Romans, at the end of the chapter, we'll look at it maybe in a little bit, but he said, who is he that condemns? Who is he that lays anything to the charge of God's elects? And he's emphasizing, it's not the Father. It's not Jesus. So what's happening? The Spirit of God will convict you. Another way of saying that, he will convince you. He will convince you of what's true and what's right. He will reveal to you light. In the light, when you see you've been off, you believed wrong, you did wrong, when you see it, your own heart will condemn you. Oh, is everybody listening? Your own heart will condemn you. That's not the Holy Spirit condemning you. That's your own heart. And that's why you need to repent, acknowledge it, confess it. Now there are people who try to say, well, if Jesus already paid for all my sins, past, present, and future, then why do I need to repent for anything? It's not to get God to stop being mad at you. He's already accepted Jesus' sacrifice is to get your own heart to stop bothering you. And just because he has done it 
doesn't mean you have received it. If all that's necessary for salvation is what God has done, then he gave Jesus for the sins of the whole world and Jesus has paid the price for the sins of the whole world. And if it's completely only based on that, then everybody will be saved regardless of what they worship or what they did or didn't do. That's not what the Bible says. If he's already done it for everybody, why won't they all be saved? Because they haven't all received it. What's been provided by grace must be received by faith. And even though if, if, you, do, if you violate right, light and you do wrong, even though God's already paid for that, it's true, he already knows it, you still, if your heart's bothering you, how do I get this fixed? How do I, people say, well, just ignore it. Jesus already paid. No, no, you don't just ignore it. You come to him, you confess it, you acknowledge it. You say, Lord, I knew better than that. Lord, you showed me and, and, and I, I, I call that sin and wrong, I confess it. But you don't wait a moment and, and receiving any condemnation. You say, I receive cleansing. I receive washing. I receive the righteousness of Christ and you give no place to condemnation. Can you say amen or oh me? You must receive. How many would agree in order to be saved, you got to receive Jesus. You got to receive the washing of the blood. Well, after you're saved, if your heart's bothering you for something, that's what you got to do. You got to receive and continue to receive. Now what's the problem? Your heart's condemning you. And if your heart's bothering you, God already knows it. So why would you try to hide it? You can't. Don't run from him, run to him. And deal with it. Acknowledge it and receive forgiveness and cleansing and give no place to condemnation. Because verse 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And it goes on to say, And whatever we ask of Him, we receive it. Brother, Brother Copeland was referring to this just earlier. Why would it be, Mark eleven twenty four? 24, what things serve you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you'll have them, and while you stand praying, forgive? Why say that? Because condemnation is the confidence killer. If your heart is bothering you, it'll prevent your faith from working. Faith is of the heart. Romans 10 says, for with the heart man believes. And if your heart is bothering you with guilt, with shame, it, it undermines, then you can say it like this, you won't have confidence toward God. Can you see verse 21? If your heart doesn't condemn you, that's when you have confidence toward God. Now the devil knows this so much better than we have known it, which is why he continually tries to effect and perpetuate some degree of shame or blame or guilt in our lives because he knows it just cripples your faith. It just undermines your confidence. Look with me in the book of Revelation. You got time for this today? Are you okay? Yeah. Book of Revelation. And the 12th chapter. Thanks be to God. Anybody remember what we're talking about here? There is, therefore, 
Now? How much? How much? In Revelation 12, the Bible tells us, gives us insight into the continuous ministry of the devil. The Bible said in Revelation uh, 12 and 9, talked about the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. Now, another of his names is adversary. Adversary. Do you remember what is in Peter where he said, uh, uh, your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Don't you like that word may? There's some he may devour and there's some he may not. I'm a may not. How about you? What, what do I mean by that? He, he comes and even though he won't say it like that, his attack and assault is saying, may I devour you? And you need to go, no, no, you may not. I resist you, go, leave. But he is subtle, not obvious. Do not underestimate his subtlety. He is very scheming, tricky. He is the most proficient and effective liar there has ever been. He's the father of it. And he is the, mo the most proficient, most effective pretender, actor that there has ever been transforms himself into an angel of light, a believable angel of light that many have listened to and followed in error, thinking it was God. He's very, very subtle. But notice what he's doing. Verse uh, 10, he said, I heard a loud voice saying, now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the, for the what? accuser of our brethren is cast down, which did what? Accused them before God, before our God, day and night. How often, how much? This is all the time. Why would the adversary devote so much resource effort and time to this. Why? To do what? Accuse. Identify, child of God, this spirit because it is a lot of the, the turmoil and bad stuff that you've been seeing and hearing. You will see and hear accusations. Accusations. Accusations and blame and shame. These are words that should never come out of our mouth. The phrase, shame on you. Should never come out of our mouth. Why? Jesus went to the cross to get shame off of us. Is that right? How dare we try to put shame on somebody? Oh, friend, this is, this is revelation. This is light. Are, are you awake? Do you want to be a partner of the devil? Trying to make people feel guilty. Trying to make people feel ashamed. Trying to make people feel embarrassed. And get this one, trying to make people pay trying to make people pay for their mistakes, pay for their failures and sins. That, my friend, is devilish. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Not God. Who lays any charge against God's elect? Romans says, not, not God. Huh? Who's 
accusing? Who's laying the charge? Who's blaming? Who's shaming? Is this going on though all around us? It's, the, the enemy sadly has taken over huge portions of social media that's devoted solely to this stuff 24 seven. What, shaming, accusing, blaming? Why? It is the God of this world that's behind it. It's the devil. Oh friend, do you remember what happened with Jesus one day when he was teaching and there was a disturbance in the back and these religious leaders and men came dragging a poor woman, probably not even properly clothed, up into the front and plopping her down in front of uh, Jesus. Now who would do this to somebody? These are religious people. Religious spirits are some of the meanest on the planet. They will cut you, they will steal from you, they will kill you and give you scriptures why it's okay. But it's got nothing to do with Jesus. They threw her down there, poor dear. Talk about embarrassed and scared. She figures she's about to die. She's about to be stoned. And you, you remember the scripture said that they demanded of him. Did you hear that phrase? So I, I'm not just, just talking references. I'm talking about us identifying wrong spirits. The spirits that are behind trying to assign guilt and shame and blame are not of God. Hmm? These, these spirits that are behind demanding, demanding, I'm gonna make you do something. I'm gonna force you to do something. That is straight from the devil. God, the most powerful, who has the ability, refuses to force anyone no matter how desperately they need it. People need to be saved, but God won't force anybody. And if he's our father, we should act like him. And there comes a point when people don't wanna hear what you say, you need to back off. You need to be quiet. When people, you know, uh, the, the Lord's corrected me one time. We, we've probably all done it. In my ignorance and in my inexperience, I was so, I so wanted some of my relatives to get some of the things of God and they were bristling at me and they didn't like it and I kept pushing and they just got more mad and the Lord dealt with me after that conversation. He said, you need to stop that, quit that. I thought, well, Lord, I, they, they need this. And this is what he said to me. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside, he said, son, it's not what you know, it's not what they need but what will they receive? Yeah. 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 What will they receive? And he said, you don't know enough about it to know, only the Holy Spirit knows what they'll receive and you're not the only one that they can receive from. A lot of times they won't receive it just cause it's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> and you need to back off and say, Lord, please send laborers across their path. Somebody you know they'll listen to and then let him use you to be a laborer for somebody else. Not everyone's ready for you. But God knows who is. But one thing for sure, you don't, I mean, if, you, if you're gonna stay with the Holy Spirit, you don't cross the line to the point of trying to make somebody do something. Yeah. This includes your spouse. <laughs> well, well, the Bible says, 
You're supposed to submit to me. Never say that. Never. Husbands, never. Say, why? Because read that scripture. The Lord was not even talking to you in that verse. He wasn't talking to you. Well, what if, what if they don't submit? Well, then they won't. What if they never do? Well, then they never will. God won't make them. You leave them alone. Other way around. The Bible said you're supposed to love me like Jesus loved the church. Dear, he wasn't talking to you. He was not talking to you. Have you, have you read these verses? They start out with an address. Husbands. Wives, I ain't talking to you. Husbands. Right? Then he said, wives. Husbands, I'm not talking to you. Wives. But I just say that as an example. The moment you go past trying to help, trying to teach, trying to enlighten, trying to inspire, trying to strengthen, the moment you go past that line and start trying to make somebody do something, you have left the Holy Spirit. And now you begin to open yourself up to wrong spirits. Because that is exactly what the evil spirits want to do. They are manipulators. They are controllers. They are forcers. That's why Jesus said to the disciples one time, he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Because they were going to go in there and call fire down. They're going to make this place shape up. No, 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 no. And it's one thing to try to help somebody see the light and see the truth. Speaking the truth in love. But if you go past that and you're trying to make them feel ashamed, you have left the Holy Spirit. And you are yielding now to a wrong spirit. If you're trying to make them feel guilty, are you trying to make them pay for what they did? You have left the Holy Spirit. Is this okay? What, what are we talking about? Do you remember the text? There is what? Huh? I mean, if the Lord has forgotten our sins and iniquities and remembers them no more, he's not trying to make us pay for anything. He's not trying to make us ashamed or feel guilty or bad. Who are we to turn around and try to make somebody else feel bad? or make somebody else pay for what they did. Who are we that judges another man's servant? Oh, somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. There is therefore. When? When? Now. Now what? No. Condemnation. Somebody say no. No condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation. Go with me please to Titus, the second chapter. I want to give you an answer that has blessed me so much that for years I did not understand how this could work, this verse could work. Did I tell you what scripture or not? <laughs> the wind's blowing my notes away. Don't turn it off though. <laughs> Titus. <laughs> yeah, keep it coming. Titus 2 and 15. I want you to look at this. Go, make the effort to turn to it. Mark it. Titus 2. Uh, verse 13, he said, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how much? From how much? All iniquity. All iniquity. Did he do it? Yes, he Has he done it? Yes, he how much iniquity have you been redeemed from? 
How much? And how much do you lack being complete in him? I am complete right now in him. Why? Not because of what I've done, because of what he's done. He said to purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Now look at that last phrase. Let no man do what? Despise you. Say that out loud. Let no man despise you. How many? One definition of despise is to devalue. To devalue or to belittle. It's the opposite of honor. To honor is to value, to esteem highly, and to despise is the opposite of honor. To despise is to belittle, to treat as insignificant, trivial, unimportant, or even past that, to, to disdain. Said out loud, let no man despise you. Now, I've read that for years and I thought, sounds good, Lord, but how can I prevent other people from despising me? Because, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you preach prosperity and hang out with Brother Kenneth, yeah, yeah, yeah. They and then if you dare to get an airplane and not hide it, yeah. and other things, I mean, you would get some ugly grounds ugly letters. And I've had some people, you know, call me everything but a nice fella. And I've had people wait on me out in the parking lot and I thought they were going to take a swing at me. Just, you know, and talk about me like I was filth. They assume I'm a liar and a thief. That I steal widow ladies social security checks and ride around in a big fat jet scum of the earth. They don't know anything about me. None of that is true. But some people have thought, they have despised me. So my thought is, great, but how can I prevent them from despising me? How can I prevent them from seeing me the way they see me and thinking about me the way they think about me? How can I do that? The answer is you can't. You can't. You can't control what people think. You can't control what people say. You can't control what people believe. And if God won't control them, you can't. So then my, my thought is, what, yeah, but what about this? The word is true. Finally, thank God, the Lord helped me to see. It's not in controlling them. It's in controlling your response to their despising. Don't let them change the way you see you. Don't allow them to devalue you and you accept their perception of you. Ah, oh, this is worth you coming to church today, right? Huh? Is, is everybody here? This, why? Because, and for the most part, people don't even realize the devil's using them. And sadly, he uses people's own family members a whole lot. People get mad. They're, they're over familiar with each other and they're aware of their faults and shortcomings and they're just judging them after the flesh and not seeing their heart and seeing what God sees. But people will get mad and they say some of the most hurtful things and they'll try to, uh, the, without even realizing it, the enemy will flood their memory with details from past failures and problems and people in their anger and in their frustration and their depression 
they will become a mouthpiece for the accuser of the brethren. And they become, like Brother Kenneth was saying, an accessory to the adversary. And even though, you know, you may not respond to it, if you care about people and you care about what they think, you can let those words in you. And the enemy will bring them back to your mind a hundred thousand times and loop. You, did, you, did you hear what they said about you? Did you hear what they called you? Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? And if you receive that, and if you ponder it and meditate it and think it and talk about it, you are allowing them to devalue you. You are allowing them to despise you. You are receiving the condemnation. You are receiving the guilt, the shame. You are receiving their assessment of you. And so many people, even church going people, are so insecure, not knowing who they are and what they are in Christ well enough, so insecure that they're always looking for somebody else to tell me who I am. They're always pulling for compliments. They're always pulling for, you know, give me a place, acknowledge my gift, tell me something. And that also makes you vulnerable to a criticism. Well, we're into some things now, aren't we? I want, you to, I want you to quote the text to me right now. The text, Romans 8, 1. Huh? There is what? <laughs> there is what? You, do you know why there would be absolutely no condemnation to you? Because you would not receive it. You would not receive an accusation from the adversary, either directly to your mind or through anybody, even if it's somebody close to you, you still, we need to develop our senses spiritually so that we can detect an accusation of the adversary trying to put us in condemnation and guilt and shame. We can detect it afar off. And when we sense that's what it is, we go into resistance mode. And we give it no place. And this is, well, haven't you missed it and made a lot of mistakes? You know I have. Every one of us have said and done things, even since we've been born again, that we would not want to get up on the platform and put a spotlight and tell everybody about it. Somebody said, don't you feel ashamed for that? No. What do you mean? I'm either forgiven or I'm not. I'm either washed or I'm not. I'm either clean or I'm not. I'm either righteous and made holy or I'm not. I've had people say, yeah, but you, you don't know what I've done, preacher. And I said, yeah, and you don't know how powerful the blood of the spotless lamb is. I am not going to be more impressed with your big sin than I am the blood of the spotless lamb. Oh. Neither give place to the devil, to the adversary. He goes about seeking whom he may, may, may devour. And the next verse says, resist him. Didn't he say it? Resist him steadfast in the faith. You got to resist it. I don't care who it is. If it's your brother, if it's your sister, if it's your spouse, if it's your pastor, I don't care who it is. If they start trying to make you feel ashamed, Come on. you need to resist that with everything in your being. Come on. Come on. 
If they start trying to make you feel guilty, you need to resist that. And it, whether you say it out loud or not, you need to say it inside yourself, I don't receive that. I, don't receive that. I refuse yeah. to receive that. Now, if you've messed up, you do, we've already been through this, you do need to confess it, you do need to acknowledge it first and foremost to the Lord. If you sinned against them, then you do need to admit it and ask their forgiveness, but you don't receive condemnation. And that's where people have gotten all mixed up. If you found out of a mistake that I've made since I've been born again. I'm not happy about it. I wouldn't be proud of it. But I refuse to let you put any condemnation on me. I, I, the Lord has helped me. I'm, I'm learning. I'm complete in Him. I really am washed and clean and forgiven. So you can't make me feel guilty about it no matter what it was. I won't be haughty about it, but I'll come back and say, I am forgiven. I am clean. I am washed and I've received it. You should be ashamed. I won't be. I refuse to be. Why? Because I've also learned it's a trick of the enemy. He paints it as being humble and pious, but what is happening is that condemnation will gut your faith. It will undermine your confidence. If your heart's bothering you, you don't have confidence toward God. If I'm gonna have faith for my healing, if I'm gonna have faith for our finances, if I'm gonna have faith for the ministry, I can't tolerate any condemnation. No guilt, no shame, it will gut my confidence. Say it out loud, let no man, let no man despise you. Despise you. <laughs> let no man, that means nobody. You don't have to be haughty, you don't have to be arrogant, and you don't cross the line, and I'm gonna make you respect me. You can't, quit that. I'm gonna make you respect me, you can't. I'm gonna make you pay for what you did? That's devilish, that's evil. But on the other hand, don't come trying to make me feel ashamed. Do not come trying to lay a guilt trip on me. I won't get in the car. I won't go on that trip with you. Shame on you. I mean, when you start saying that phrase, I'm already turning to leave. Jesus went to the cross. The cross was not a pretty place. It was the gas chamber of its day. It was the electric chair of its day. It was the place of execution for the worst of the worst criminals. And what happened there wasn't pretty. We honor it above all, but it wasn't pretty. It's symbolized by a snake on a pole. That's what symbolizes Jesus on the cross. Why, a snake? Yeah, because he was made sin with our sin and the judgment of God fell on him there. And the people mocked him. Do you remember that? They demanded of him and they mocked him and they ridiculed him and they tried to shame him. Why? He never sinned one time. Why is he there? He's taking it from me. He's taking it, oh, come on, can you see this? He's taking this abuse. Hebrews 12, he endured this contradiction of sinners against himself. He endured this pain. He was spit on, he was mocked, he was hit, he was dressed up and undressed and kicked and thorns, why? Abused, demeaned, shamed, not for himself. He took it so I could be. Therefore, now. 
Having what? No. Having what? No. no. Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. Shame, guilt, blame. If something's bothering your heart, confess it and receive forgiveness and then do not receive any guilt or shame about it anymore. Somebody tries to bring up something to you, do not receive it. Do not let anybody despise you. Don't receive it. They can do whatever they want to do, but you don't have to receive it. Stand on your feet, everybody. Woo, glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, lift your hands, lift your, lift your voice. Say, thank you, Lord. 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 Just close your eyes. Let's act on this right now. Everybody say, Father, anyone and everyone who's done anything against me I forgive them by faith. I release it. They owe me nothing. Not an apology, not an explanation, no recompense. They owe me nothing. I forgive them. No matter how I feel, I have forgiven them by faith. by faith. Now say this, and I receive, I receive complete forgiveness, forgiveness, complete washing, complete washing. By, the by the blood, I receive, I receive. Being, made being made holy, being made righteous, being made righteous. I, am I am complete, complete. right now in Christ, in Christ. And, therefore, and therefore, there is, there is no, no condemnation, condemnation to, me. to me. Oh, praise God. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Praise be to God. 